And as I begin to say a few things about Dr. Stanley Jones, I would like to begin with this introduction. Dr. Jones was a different kind of uh, missionary evangelist in his times. Oftentimes he had, we'll talk more about it, he had in his uh, public meetings where he would invite a non-Christian dignitary, a well-known person in the community to preside over his meetings. And in those days, the academic setting, one of the responsibilities of the presiding chairman is to introduce the speaker and listen to him very carefully, even the audience don't, and then give his closing remark on what the speaker said. So that way he can make the chairman to listen to him. And one evening, there was a dignitary in a certain town, was asked to preside over, and the gentleman came and gave this introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so privileged and honored to have Dr. E. Stanley Jones as the speaker of the occasion. And I want to call your attention, a careful attention to what he has to say, because if what Dr. Jones says tonight is not true, it doesn't matter. But if what he says is true, then nothing else matters. If what he says is not true, it doesn't matter. But if it is true, and nothing else matters. Dr. Stanley Jones, lived from 1884 to 1973, was born in 1884 in, in the United States, of course, and as a young man of 23, a fresh graduate from Asbury Theological Seminary, which is known to a lot of Methodists from around the world. As a young man of 23 years old, he arrived in India in 1907 as a missionary of the American Methodist Mission Board. And keeping India as his base, unlike William Taylor was here only for five years as a resident, Stanley Jones made this his home for 66 years until his death on January 25, 1973. During his lifetime, Time Magazine identified him the world's greatest missionary. World Outlook Magazine named him Missionary Extraordinary. Two times he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And the second time he lost it to only Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A renowned bishop described him as the greatest missionary since St. Paul. As a global evangelist, he had traveled extensively, presenting the gospel on a one-on-one -on -one basis to presidents and prime ministers of nations, including Mahatma Gandhiji and the Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in our country. Intellectuals and executives, executives, while also preaching to hundreds of thousands of hungry masses, speaking three or more times daily. He spoke at the celebrated Maraman Convention of the Martha Masidian Church in Kerala to a recorded crowd of 150,000 people every day in the month of February for 400, and, sorry, 44 consecutive years every year. It is estimated overall he preached 60,000 times in his lifetime, sometimes even five to seven times a day to small groups. As an evangelist, he was busy around the clock, around the year, around the world. As a prolific writer, he authored 31 books, besides contributing numerous articles to Christian journals. His books have sold more than 3.5 million copies and have been translated in 30 languages around the world. As a missionary strategist, Jones was way ahead of his contemporaries. There's so much we can learn from his life, his ministry, and the evangelistic missionary strategies he employed 
in his generation. He was a missionary evangelist, just like William Taylor. And God had bestowed on him a brilliant mind and an exceptional power of, for communication. Only a few of his contemporaries could match his capacity for interpreting the gospel as something irresistibly attractive and relevant to the modern and postmodern age and presenting it contextually. He substantiated his evangelistic apologetics with indisputable illustrations from the fields of religion and philosophy, science and psychology. An analysis of his missionary strategies, to be more precise, his evangelistic strategies cannot be fully justified without first analyzing his theology of mission, which was foundational to his endeavors. And I say, give that analysis, I would like to inform you ahead that this lecture, you'll find it to be slightly different than the one, the previous one. Because Stanley Jones, as the primary audience happened to be intellectuals, the intelligentsia of India, he specifically talked at them. So his language, his writing, everything came in part with that challenge. So you'll, you'll see this a little more academic than the previous one at the same time combined with the scripture challenge that comes to us. And here we go. John's theology of missions. Jones, sorry, Jones theology of missions. Jones theology of mission emerges out of four integrated or interrelated theological phenomenon. Namely, one is unquenchable passion for God in Christ. Two, his passion for humanity. Three, his passion for the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. And four, his pa passion for evangelism. One, his passion for God in Christ. Former professor of Asbury Theological Seminary and a long-term associate of Stanley Jones, described him as a Christ intoxicated person. Indeed, he was Christholic, a God addict. Jones declared, I'm an ordinary man doing extraordinary things because I'm linked with the extraordinary. That link with extraordinary was a source of his powerful evangelistic ministry for 66 remarkable years without break. Once someone after listening to his passionate presentation of the gospel commented, Jesus has God into you, hasn't he? Jones exuberantly replied, yes, and he has raised my temperature. It was said of Count Nicholas Zinzendorf, founder of the great missionary Moravian church, I have one passion, it is he, he alone. Stanley Jones too, was so overwhelmed with a passion for Jesus Christ that he sought to know Christ, not only through his own personal experience, but also the experience, through the experience of others of Christ. He believed that each nation has something distinctive to contribute to the interpretation of the universal Christ. Each individual has something distinctive to contribute to the fuller interpretation of Christ. When he eagerly presented Christ to others, he was equally eager to learn more about Christ through others. In his classical first book entitled The Christ of the Indian Road, he describes with passion the Christ whom he had discovered through the cultural context and spiritual quests of the people of India. And true to his own cultural heritage, he also wrote another book entitled The Christ of the American Road. Then affirming that we could always learn about Christ from each and every cultural experience and interpretations of people, he wrote yet another book calling it The Christ of Every Road. In the Indian religious tradition, a man or woman of outstanding devotion to God is reverently addressed as a bhakta. 
even the proudest states in India would bow in respect before a true Bhakta. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, both as a person and as an evangelist, was a Krishna Bhakta par excellence, one who was consumed with a passion for Jesus Christ. Two, his passion for humanity. In his autobiography, A Song of Ascents, Stanley Jones noted, if every man is part of every man he has met, and he is, that every man I have met across the span of over half a century in east and west, north and south is a part of me. I, I owe much to the sons of men. They have enriched me. My gratitude is unbounded. He had an enormous passion for people of different cultures and races anywhere, anytime. So he wrote, I looked into the face of the son of man and then looked into the face of the sons of men. I say daughters of men. And I spent my life trying to bring them together. After the one look into that one dear face of the son of man, I had never seen any uninteresting face of the sons and daughters of men. They're also worthwhile with infinite possibilities. His passion for people is best illustrated by a missiological principle called naturalization of the gospel, which he originated, practiced, and propagated. What is the naturalization of the gospel? Naturalization of the gospel is an incarnational principle of evangelism, which as enumerated by Dr. Samuel Kamalesan means, a Christian affirmation of human dignity born out of an inner identity with Jesus Christ on the basis of which we become part of the essential humanity in context. A Christian affirmation of human dignity born out of an inner identity with Jesus Christ on the basis of which we become part of the essential humanity in context. The principle of naturalization of the gospel consists of three integral parts. Number one, it affirms human dignity. The biblical doctrine of humans as creations in the image of God underscores the validity, nobility, and dignity which are inherent in every person in respect, in respect of sex, race, color, creed, and social status. Where this human dignity is recognized and honored, there'll be no room for discrimination of any kind. Instead, sociocultural distinctness will be mutually affirmed and respected, resulting in a spontaneous celebration of the otherness in others and producing a spirit of equality and fraternity. All those separated by culture and language, all humans are equal and united by creation as the images of God. As Dr. Sam Kamalesan emphasized, Jesus Christ is not comfortable with any one culture exclusively, but he is essential to every culture in the world. Christ purifies every culture and gives dignity to every person created in God's image. Two, it affirms our identity with Jesus Christ. A Christian affirmation of human dignity emerges out of our inner identity with Jesus Christ. The identity releases us from all bondages, restores us to full freedom, and recreates us into one new humanity in Christ as the scripture affirms. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So this creative newness we receive by being in Christ disentangles us from the prejudice against others 
and enables to see others also as an integral part of that one essential humanity we share in Christ and calls us to uphold the dignity of every person. One who is in Christ cannot be otherwise. Jesus affirmed this dignity in the Jew and the Samaritan, in the bureaucrats and the proletariats, in the saints and in the sinners, in every man and in every woman. So must be the affirmation of everyone who calls oneself a disciple of Christ. And three, it leads us to become a part of all humanity. Jesus, the word became flesh, not just Jewish flesh, but flesh that represented and included all humanity in itself. Although Jesus was born a Jew, he was a universal human being. He conscientiously belonged to humanity as a whole, stubbornly refusing to limit his interpersonal relationship only to those categories of people approved by parochial Judaism. He mingled freely with the prohibited segments of society, such as the Samaritans, the publicans, and the prostitutes. He knew he had come to die for all of them and that he belonged to every one of them. Hence, all those who claim to belong to Christ must have within them the spontaneous urge to become an integral part of the universal humanity of which Christ himself is the nucleus. It was this intense urge which made Stanley Jones to declare every man is part of every man he has met and everyone who belongs to Jesus belongs to everyone who belongs to Jesus. Then thirdly, his passion for the advancement of the kingdom of God. To Stanley Jones, mission is the church's endeavor to expand the kingdom of God on earth. And evangelism is the persuasion of humans to enter into that kingdom. He saw four distinct and integral aspects of the kingdom that have a direct bearing upon the mission of the church. One, the inseparability, inseparability of Christ from his kingdom. Jesus saw, John saw Christ and his kingdom as synonyms. They're inseparably linked together in an organic substance of truth. The character of the kingdom is seen in the character of Jesus. Namely, the kingdom of God is Christ likeness universalized and Christ is the kingdom personalized. The unshakable kingdom is the absolute order and the unchanging person Jesus Christ is the absolute person. These are two absolutes together. Now they have coerced and have become one. As Dr. Kamalison has constantly declared that the two absolutes have become one single absolute absolute. Jones's mission missiology or mission theology emerges out of the fusion of the two absolutes together as such. Mission must be carried out within the purview of all that the kingdom of God has to offer humans under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the kingdom of God is God's total order for total human. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant said, two things strike me with awe, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. What was a matter of awe and wonder for Immanuel Kant was to Jones, God's total order for the governors of all of creation, both celestial and terrestrial, as revealed in the Bible. The order which humans have rejected since creation was exactly what Jesus Christ came to reestablish on the earth. Jesus called it the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven interchangeably. The new order which Jesus Christ inaugurated on earth 
is uniquely designed to cater to the total needs of the total human being. The new order does not reform society, but it regenerates it. In fact, in giving the great commission to his disciples, Jesus entrusted to them the responsibility of expanding the kingdom, expanding the horizons of this new order of the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Thirdly, the nature of the kingdom of God is both individual and social. God's concern for humans is holistic. He cares for the total welfare of the total human, namely the spiritual and the physical of both the individual and society as a whole. Therefore, argued Jones, an individual gospel without a social gospel is a soul without a body. And a social gospel without an individual gospel is a body without a soul. One is a ghost, the other is a corpse. But the gospel we believe is one living organic whole. To Jones, evangelism was the presentation of the gospel, which means the presentation of the person of Christ for the receptors, personal faith and repentance, and the kingdom as the new social order for the liberated person. He said, the social, thus social responsibility or social justice becomes an aspect not of Christian mission only, but also of Christian conversion. It is impossible to be truly converted to God without being truly converted to a neighbor. Fourthly, the kingdom of God is a way to total freedom. The kingdom of God is the only holistically redemptive institution on earth. And the only way out for all the over escalating, ever escalating global problems of war and social injustice and hunger and poverty. The greatest freedom humans need is freedom from self imprisonment, self entanglement. The kingdom of God offers us total freedom by offering us a sense of purpose, direction, meaning, and wholeness. It shows that one, humans have a destiny to live for. Stanley Jones emphasized man and nature and the whole universe was made by Christ and for Christ. That a destiny is therefore written into the structure of new things and that structure and that destiny is a Christian destiny. Since Christ is the kingdom personalized and the kingdom is Christ, the universe, Christ likeness universalized, as a person who has found one of them, has found both of them, that person has arrived home. Secondly, humans have a dignity to live with. Dignity is an emotional trait that deals with a phenomenon of human worth and self-respect. Humans have an inborn urge to earn their self-respect and worth from each other. They seek to do so by defining dignity in various ways and means. Christ and the kingdom offers the most sublime and splendid form of dignity. John said, there is no higher status in the world or the next than to be sons of God or daughter of God and to be made in the likeness of the divine son and to belong to the unshakable kingdom and to the unchanging person. That makes trivial and tinsel any other status. Our dignity is not determined by who we are, but whose we are. We belong to Christ and his kingdom. That settles it. Thirdly, humans have a design to live by. The mission of Christ is to transform humans into wholesome persons. The kingdom of God is God's design by which he's building up a new humanity, a new world order. The new order has deep and wide implications for individuals and communities 
that Jesus Christ articulated it in the Nazareth Manifesto, as it is called, according to Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. It is the good news preached to the poor, which meets the needs of the economically disinherited. He came to release the captives, which means he meets the needs of the socially and politically disinherited. He came to give recovery of sight to the blind, which means he meets the needs of the physically disinherited. He came to set at liberty of the oppressed, which means he meets the needs of the spiritually and morally disinherited. And he came to make the proclamation of the year of Jubilee, which signals the beginning of the new world order and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Then the other one, finally, his passion for evangelism. It is said that Christian faith in Palestine, and probably you heard it before, the Christian faith in Palestine began as a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. And the Christian faith moved to Greece and became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome and became an institution. Then it moved all over Europe and became a culture. Finally, it moved to North America and became an enterprise, a business. Although it's just tired. In one sense, all of these seem useful. It is indeed useful to have a sound Christian philosophy for education, a well-structured Christian institution for discipline and growth, a refined culture based on Christian principles to preserve social values and order, and a Christian enterprise to market biblical ethics globally. However, if the Christian faith becomes circular, going round and round and round, based exclusively on these points, then it would be void of, of its important evangelistic mission of bringing humans into a personal relationship with Christ. Why must we bring people to Christ? Because Stanley Jones saw that humans and Christ are meant for each other. He said, everything and everybody is structured to be Christ. It is a destiny written, written within us, whom he did predestinate to be made into the likeness of his son. That destiny is written into our blood, our, into our blood, our nerves, our tissues, our organs, and our relationships. He insisted, some say it is hard to be a Christian, but I say it is harder not to be a Christian. That was his stand. And he declared, Tertullian in the early centuries said, it is hard to be a Christian, but I say it is harder not, no, sorry. He, the Tertullian said, the soul is naturally Christian. Reynold Neighbor says that the soul is naturally pagan. Dr. Walter Harden says the soul is na naturally half pagan and half Christian. But Stanley Jones said, I vote with Tertullian that the soul is naturally Christian. Evangelism is inherent in the nature of things. And Jones was determined to begin where Christianity began originally in Palestine as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he carried out that determination in his evangelism with a sublime passion. Speaking of the motive for evangelism, traditionally, the Great Commission is presented in Matthew 28, 19, 21. Go and make disciples of all nations as the most important motive or reason for evangelism. The Great Commission is perceived as a divine missiological missionary imperative that demands absolute obedience. But Jones advocated evangelism not from the perspective of an imperative that must be obeyed, but as an emergency that must be attended to. He said, as far as the Great Commission, 
It is not based on a command, go, but upon the very nature of the gospel itself. Because upon him, upon Christ, last command or no last command, we must share Jesus Christ for the necessities of human life command us and demand us to give us a savior such as Jesus. Jesus as it happened, just as it happened to Jesus, so it did happen to Stanley Jones. That the needs of people around him in India and around the world aroused him, in him a passion for evangelism. People need Jesus because people are hurt and lost without him. Therefore, we must give Jesus to the needy humanity everywhere. It was said of Sadhu Sundar Singh, the great evangelist of India, who presented the gospel with such passion that whenever he preached, it looked as if he had just stepped directly out of the pages of the New Testament into the auditorium. The evangelist E. Stanley Jones has merited a similar metaphor. He too preached with such a passion that his audience could symbolically feel the heat around him when he preached. Once a Hindu chairman in his closing remarks said, I sat on this platform very near the fire tonight. Stanley Jones admitted that the fire was burning in his bones as it did in Jeremiah, the prophet of the Old Testament. The fire burning in his bones, I believe, was enkindled by his passion for his God's word. He wrote, I'm going to say something which I've been saying half playfully and half seriously. And I'm going to say it entirely seriously now. If I keep in my present state of mind and purpose, I will ask for 24 hours of rest after I arrive in heaven. Then I'll ask for 24 hours more to visit with my friends and renew my acquaintances. Then I would go up to Jesus and say, this is wonderful, heaven is wonderful, and I do not deserve to be here. Grace brought me home and I love it here. But Lord, haven't you a world that has fallen, that needs an evangelist, please send me. And I would mean it. For I know of no heaven more heavenly than proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. What a passion. Now moving on from his kingdom theology of missions. The Jesus Jones's contextual strategies of mission evangelism. An effective communication of the gospel requires the communicator to be able to discern the trends of time, the environment, and the culture of the receptors. As a master communicator, Stanley Jones was exceptionally sensitive to the trends of his time and invented evangelistic strategies most appropriate for his context. He invented three creative ways of presenting the gospel to the predominantly Hindu audience of his time. Number one, his public lectures. At a period when almost all evangelistic meetings in India were conducted on church premises, Jones launched on a most direct way like William Taylor to take the gospel to the non-Christians in public places. As most non-Christians would be uncomfortable in a church setting, in a church building, he took the gospel to the public square where the people mingled freely. He organized his meetings in the open spaces and the cool of the evenings in town halls, in Hindu and the Christian college auditoriums, theosophical society halls, and in Hindu temple compounds. And here is something unique. He would also invite a prominent leader of the local community, a dignitary, but preferably a non-Christian dignitary, a retired justice of the court, a retired police official, a retired professor 
by the principal of a non-Christian college or the government-run colleges to preside over the meeting and to close it with a local community and with a concluding remark. The chairman represented the cross-section of society, such as politicians, the lawyers and judges, army generals and professors, leading men of Hindu and Muslim communities. In this, Jones strictly adhered to certain Christian principles in interfaith evangelism as follows. One, be the audience must know exactly what it is going to come and hear. Two, announce beforehand there is no, there will be no attack upon anyone's religion. Three, allow the audience to ask questions at the close of the meeting. Face everything and dodge no difficulties. Four, get the leading non-Christians of the city where the meetings are to be held to become chairman of our meetings. Five, Christianity must be defined as Christ, not as the Old Testament, not as a Western civilization, but Christ himself. And to be Christian is to follow him. And number six, Christ must be interpreted in terms of Christian experience rather than through mere argument. The strength of the strategy where the strengths. One, the public lecture followed by the question answer time was an open forum where communication took place in both ways, from the speaker to the audience and vice versa. Two, making non-Christians preside over the meetings removed mental blocks and prejudices from the minds of non-Christians. So they came to the meeting eagerly and expectantly and see, third, the question answer time facilitated the hearers to clear any misconception concerning Christ, the church, and the gospel. Second method, the roundtable conferences. Jones got this idea from a tea party hosted by a leading Hindu who had invited several of his friends to listen to Jones. It was a very innovative way of engaging people of other faiths in dialogue. Jesus invest, invented this contextual method of communication of the gospel long before the term dialogue became an attractive methodology in Christian circles. The method involved the bringing together of Christian and non-Christians, number about 20 years of time. Five of them would be Christians and the rest of them non-Christian faiths. Seated in a circle to affirm equality, they would share with each other what their respective religions means to them in personal life experience. No one would be allowed to argue or lecture or criticize other religions, not even compare his religion with others. Each one had to simply state what his particular faith meant to him in real life. The evangelist would speak at the end, not preaching Christ as at other times, but simply sharing like everyone else what Christ meant to him in his daily life, personal life experience. If religion it is essentially a matter of personal relationship to God, with God, then many in the group could not articulate it because they had no experience of God in that way. But those who did have a personal relationship with Christ spoke succinctly, thus arousing in the hearts of others intelligent and passionate questions concerning the reality of this living Christ of human experience. In this experiment, comments Dr. Kamalason, the foremost pioneer of our times, Richard Biersley in India, there must have been friendly conversations. Even now, 
that interreligious dialogue has become fashionable, not much of it is experienced based dialogue. More often, these dialogue and practice. Jones saw a threefold purpose in dialogue as an evangelistic methodology in roundtable conferences setting. One, it is an advance, it is an enhancement of mutual religious enrichment. What was that? Interfaith dialogue is a two-way communication in which the participants both speak and listen. Listen, they must, in order to make the communication meaningful. Bishop A.J. Apasami, a leading exponent of interfaith dialogue in the mission context of India observed, sharing one's faith for another means in the first place that we are prepared to receive and understand and learn. The idea that we have nothing to learn from others is always unfortunate. We must not think of others as people to whom we are always to preach. However, listening to persons of other faiths does not at all mean that the participants reach a theological consensus and compromise on matters pertaining to salvation. No. In fact, a mutual agreement on foundational beliefs may not be reached at all. So Jones claimed at the close, we might not be agreed, but we will be mutually enriched and certainly we will be closer to the real issues. The two way enrichment occurred as follows. On the one hand, the Christians participated felt he enriched in his own faith and spiritual journey in the light of other faiths and cultures and ways of life. And Jones testified that how he, as he listened to what men were saying about life and destiny and God, I watched my savior grow before me. On the other hand, for the non-Christian, a constant exposure like this to Christ and a rethinking and re-evaluation of his own faith journey in light of what the Christian had to say, challenged him or her to move his or her mind closer to Christ. The second advantage, it is evangelizing through personal experience with Christ. The round table arrangement provided a cordial atmosphere of interfaith dialogue. First, every participant who treat, was treated as an equal on equal basis with everyone else in the group. It made participation comfortable and confident. Second, all participants shared many problems in common. Hence, they were eager to see what solution other religions can offer to, offer to solve them. This gave the unique opportunity for the Christian evangelist to define Christianity not as an institution or a set of faith, but as Christ, Christ an institution with all its weakness and vulnerability and limitations. But as Christ, the person himself who can solve the problem in question. The claims of Christ were also backed by how they worked in the day to day life experience of the evangelist himself, as well as the other Christians participating in that dialogue. It was evangelism in terms of spirit witnessing to the spirit, the deep calling to the deep, for it was evangelism at the deepest level of human personality and common problems. Third one, the establishment of the unique spiritual and moral authority of Jesus. The apex point of the round table interfaith dialogue was the evangelist challenge the particip participating non-Christian on the fundamental postulates and presuppositions of religions pertaining to the goal of life and how the divine plays the role in it. As the participants listened to each other, it soon began to dawn on all of them that all religions, including Christianity, came under the scrutiny of, scrutiny of Christ through his revelation. They realized that while Christianity could be criticized from certain angles, Christ could never be criticized justifiably as it was soon established that Christ himself was the judge 
of all religious and spiritual claims. This was exactly the truth which Jones aimed to make preeminent in the round table conference. The unique moral and spiritual authority of Jesus was established in the light of his character and claims of being the embodiment of true religion. He stood out morally impeccable and spiritually authoritative and that no religion had the capacity to match his personality. The end result was an awesome feeling of admiration enkindled in the hearts of the participants by the inescapable influence of Christ in a short span of time. Jones testifies that there was not a single situation in which before the close of the round table conference, Christ was not in moral and spiritual command of the situation. At the close, everything else had been pushed to the edges and Christ controlled the situation. There's another third methodology, the Christian ashrams. Jones was best to establish a Christian ashram in 1930 in an estate called Satal under the foothills of the Himalayas that most Methodists have really heard of, if not visited there yet. Soon it spread all over India with several ashrams established in different places. Eventually it also went overseas to United States, Japan, and other nations. The ashram emerged primarily out of the felt need for group discipline. It was a great place for training oneself in Christian discipleship in the setting of community living. The Christian ashram had Christ as the divine guru, not divine guru, not the human guru, and Jones as its acharya, a religious teacher or instructor. The modus operandi was a group of 20 or 20 people again, including youth and children and family from various walks of life who lived together in community for about six to eight weeks. They had everything in common, such as food, shelter, worship, and community service. They addressed each other simply as brother and sister, not by any professional title as a doctor, lawyer, or otherwise, or even pastor, or even bishop, be it clerical or secular. The ashram served and continued to serve two important missional purposes. First, the realization of the kingdom of God in a miniature structure. The spirit of the ashram consisted in individual and corporate attempts to develop personal freedom within the framework of an inclusive Christian brotherhood demonstrated by a deep and mutual reverence for Christ and one another. They tried to experience the kingdom of God personalized in Christ and then interpersonalized with each other. They tried to adopt and lead the incarnational lifestyle of discipleship reflected in the Jesus who became the word which became flesh. The end result of this experiment was that several participants found themselves being spiritually transformed in Christ. Jones testified that 95% of who came to those ashrams went away totally transformed. Secondly, it was a revitalization of the church through small groups. Besides pro producing personal transformation, another significant goal of the ashram was to establish a strong koinonia, a spiritual society fellowship, by its very nature, this is what the church has been called to be a koinonia, a spiritual community. But unfortunately, this is not how many a church functions today. Jones saw that in many contexts, the church had become a worshiping institution used once or twice a week. This makes fellowship a momentary thing of an hour or two in seven days. After those few hours, each goes back to his compartmentalized life. Therefore, Jones established the weekend ashrams in local churches. These ashrams helped many churches to fill the void of true fellowship by providing opportunity for Christians to come together and experience what is truly it means to live in Christian koinonia and fellowship. Now, having said all that, what lessons that his missionary methods, evangelistic methods, that offer to us today? A retrospective look at some of the most important aspects of Dr. E. Stanley Jones's evangelistic strategies offer valuable lessons for the church to follow in the mission context of India today. Number one, simple apologetics. 
You know, in the past two, three decades, apologetics as an evangelistic method has gained significant attraction in Christian circles globally. From C.S. Lewis in the 19th century to a number of reputed apologists, apologists in the 20th and 21st centuries. A great many scholars have done a brilliant job of challenging audiences worldwide with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The results of their efforts have been phenomenal. However, a closer look at the attempts of most of the apologists, if not all of them, shows that the target audience in most cases is primarily professionals and intellectuals or university students, those who belong to the higher strata of society. But there is a tremendous need to continue that approach. There is an equally tremendous need to focus on the lower strata of society and the so-called commoners and the marginalized as they make a bulk of the population everywhere, particularly in India. Is there a room for an apologetic form of evangelism applicable to the latter groups? The answer is a resounding yes. In fact, this was exactly what Apostle Peter emphasized when he wrote. But in your heart set about Christ as Lord, as I quoted earlier, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Second Peter 3.15. The target audience to whom Peter wrote was not intellectuals of his time, but just commoners. The marginalized and the persecuted Christians scattered all over the Roman world. He encouraged the commoners to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. This petrain, petrain passion of preparing commoners to present the gospel in a relational manner is what I call simple apologetics. Although Dr. Stanley Jones had prominent intellectuals as audience in his public lectures and roundtable conferences, he also eagerly took the gospel to poorer sections of society and presented it in the same apologetic manner, namely giving an answer to everyone who asked him because the reason for the hope that he had and he did with gentleness and respect. Irrespective of whom his audience was, his approach was always apologetic, even when he presented the gospel one on one to individuals. What the church in India needs today is to train willing members of the church in the art of simple apologetics. It has been fashionable for several decades now in India to present the gospel in huge mass gatherings. Of course, they have been quite productive. However, times have now changed and are rapidly changing in an environment which is antagonistic to the preaching of the gospel, especially through huge masses. The recent emergence and current escalation of organized attempts by certain outfits of society to oppose the so-called religious conversion propaganda by Christian evangelists in India calls for a rethinking in our evangelistic methods. Meanwhile, the opposition continues to grow. Hence, it may, be good, it may be a good time now for the church in India to seriously consider training ordinary Christian men and women in the art of simple apologetics of presenting the gospel with gentleness and respect, as Peter instructed the early church to do. Such an approach is likely to free the non-Christian minds from any sense of intimidation, insecurity, and even worse, infuriation against mass conversion of people of their faith to Christianity. This approach also leads to our next point, the small group dynamics of interfaith dialogue. The purpose of interfaith dialogue has been viewed differently by different thinkers who enthusiastically endorsed it. For example, Jane Farquhar, an Indian missionary, 
a prominent advocate of interfaith dialogue, argued that Christ was the fulfillment of Hinduism. And therefore, religious dialogue in India should be demonstrated, uh, is to be to demonstrate how in a, a, new, a new social situation, Jesus Christ could purify and separate the resources of Hinduism and thus bring it to bring it up to a large stage of development. To Farqua, the purpose of dialogue was the purification and development of another religion. Wesley Arya Raja of Sri Lanka opined, dialogue helps us to understand our neighbor and to know why he believes what he believes. But to Dr. Stanley Jones, he saw the ultimate purpose of interfaith dialogue was to make Christ known across religions and cultures and enable them to become his disciples. He also proved that dialogue was very effective when it is done in small group settings, such as the round table conferences. Based on the same reasons of the escalating opposition to or antagonism against the so-called religious conversion propaganda by Christian evangelists in India today, an interfaith dialogue among friends representing various faiths in a small group setting like the round table conference may be a most honest and peaceful way of presenting the gospel to others. Here again, it will be most effective if it will be done with gentleness and respect. As Peter, Paul, Apostle Peter instructed the early church to do. And three, transformation of transformation oriented church retreats. Dr. Stanley Jones launched on Christian nationalism and attempt in contextualization. He borrowed the Indian concept of ashram or guru club and used it as a tool for two purposes, namely to serve both as a form and content. The form being ashram showing the Indian community that Christians were not totally insulated by Western thoughts and practices. We can still do it the Indian way. As a content, Jones had aimed at bringing Christian transformation in the lives of participants who spend a few, few weeks in a Christian community living. However, as attending the regular ashram Satal was not practically possible for many, he extended this transformation ministry to the local churches in the form of many ashrams which we could follow. Friends, in conclusion, one of the most luminous summaries of Dr. Stanley Jones's ministry has come from the pen of Dr. Samuel Kamalason, who was a long-term associate of Dr. Jones and a featured evangelist in several of those ashrams events conducted globally. They consider it appropriate to close this article in the words of Dr. Kamalason. That Stanley Jones was a master communicator because he was a man with a focused vision the unchanging person and unshakable kingdom were present realities to him. And to live was to celebrate their presence. This focused vision attracted attention and commitment from others. Stanley Jones was a great listener, and hence vision remained, his vision remained focused. With disarming simplicity, he positioned himself within the tradition, history, and social patterns of India was a trusted friend of India. He earned this trust by affirming the new research in India, never speaking disrespectfully of the people with whom he worked, to whom God had called him. He communicated his vision through clear, engaging communication that grabs people now as then. He empowered people. This was the goal towards which he deployed himself. Those who caught this vision carried it energetically. A servant leader, Stanley Jones released astonishing amounts of resources and energy. This energy is still felt. Dear friends, we have come to this memorial lecture and we have heard two of them. Challenges from the missionary methods of two legendary Methodist missionaries, William Taylor and E. Stanley Jones. Now the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with what we have heard? Let me close with the same remark. 
that one of the chairmen in his Stanley Jones meeting made. If what I have said so far is not 